Hi, thank you to everyone for being here today. We will wait just a moment to begin as people continue to jump on the call. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We will begin shortly as we wait for a few more people to hop onto today's town hall. Hi everyone, we will go ahead and get started. I'm Kate Derrick in the Division of Communications and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today on this Return to Campus Town Hall focused on staff. Today's event is being recorded and we will share a link on the Return to Campus website. Um, and on today you will hear from our Interim Chancellor and Provost Susan Wente and Vice Chancellor for Administration Eric Kopstein. They will each share information about the Return to Campus plan for fall 2020. Then we'll have a question and answer session to respond to a series of questions that were submitted ahead of time as well as those that will be asked live on today's call. I do encourage you to watch as much of the presentation as you can, as some of your questions will likely already be answered by what's being presented today before the Q&A. If you do have a question, you can submit it at vu.edu slash live questions. Again, that's vu.edu slash live questions. We have a team that's collecting all of the questions as soon as they come in and we'll address as many of them as we can during today's event. We won't be able to get to every single one, but we are continuously updating the FAQs on the Return to Campus website uh, as questions come in. Uh, as a reminder, you can also visit the Return to Campus website at vu.edu slash fall 2020. And there are FAQs there that will address a number of questions that we've had come in. With that, I will turn it over to Interim Chancellor and Provost Susan Wente to begin. Well, thank you very much, Kate. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for joining us for this town hall that we've especially geared to help address the questions of Vanderbilt staff. I also wanna start out by thanking you not just for joining us at this town hall, but also thanking you for everything that you've done over these past months. I know that this has not been an easy time. I know that it's been challenging with all the uncertainties and all of the unknowns. But I want you to know how especially proud I am of our staff and your many, many contributions during this incredibly difficult time. We would not be where we are now. We would not be in the position that we are to welcome students back and to return to campus if it wasn't for all of your incredible efforts. You've protected our campus spaces. You've advanced technology. You've brought innovation and security to the campus. You've helped communicate our messages. You are advancing our mission in absolutely critical ways. So for that, you have my, my utmost gratitude. You've also been very instrumental in different details and logistics planning that are comprising the plan I'm gonna talk about today. Um, there's some of you out there I know who probably know details of this plan um, and, and could be doing parts of this presentation for me. I appreciate your hard work. I appreciate your resilience. And I also really appreciate your open-mindedness as we continue to navigate circumstances that none of us have ever, ever um, encountered before. So we're gonna to have to be nimble, we're gonna to have to be flexible, and we're gonna to have to really embrace our Vanderbilt values of collegiality, cooperation, and civility as we continue to navigate um, the months ahead. So I hope you have a, had a chance to review the email that incoming Chancellor Deermeyer and I sent out last week about our return to campus plan. 
During this town hall, Vice Chancellor Eric Copston and I will discuss different details. We'll cover some aspects of classrooms and dining halls and physical spaces on campus, our university-wide health and safety protocols. We know we won't answer all of the questions. That's gonna take time, but we're committed to answering those questions as Kate detailed. And understand also that there's a lot of information to process here especially as it is a highly complex um, plan and a highly complex approach to try to address how we are gonna protect every member of our community as much as possible. So I want to assure you that our decisions and what I'm gonna talk about today have been really guided by several key factors. One is that core commitment to the health and safety of every member of our staff as much as possible for us whether that means continuing and supporting your remote work, or whether that means enforcing protocols for those who are back on campus. And further, it's our commitment to our mission. Now, as you'll see on this next slide, as we've developed this return to campus plan, our guiding principles are mission driven. The question we've had to ask ourselves and the question that we've had to uh, rely on science, we had to rely on data, we've had to rely on evidence is how can we continue to pursue excellence in discovery and learning when we face the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic? We're committed to offering a broad-based liberal education of the highest excellence to our students and doing that in the context of conducting world-class research. But to do that, how do we solve for the complexities of reopening? How do we solve for the need for prevention measures to be put in place so that we slow the spread of COVID-19, prevent the spread of COVID-19? How do we provide for and solve for ensuring that the health and well-being of every member of our community is taken care of as best as possible? And then further, given the unknowns about this pandemic, how do we plan for carefully potential resurgences in cases? So as I've, I've referred to, we've done this in a thoughtful manner, we've done it in a very reasoned manner, and we've done it relying upon expertise. One part of that expertise comes from our colleagues at the medical center and from our nursing school, and it also comes from a variety of different working groups and ad hoc groups. Showed on this slide are some of the key people who've been involved in leading some of those efforts and in gathering input from individuals across our entire Vanderbilt community and across the entire, if you wanna say, national and world community of experts. This has involved vice chancellors, it's involved deans, it's involved other academic affairs leadership. It's involved the Board of Trust, as well as a special ad hoc committee of the Board of Trust, which has met to help reflect on and give guidance in terms of our response. We have a public health advisory task force, which has provided input, which has faculty and experts on it from across both the university as well as the medical center. And then we have university continuity working groups. Um, university continuity working groups have faculty, staff, and students working collaboratively and cooperatively in terms of thinking about our community and service continuity, our education continuity, and our research continuity. Now, as I referred to, we are in an especially, um, you know, especially, I want to say, powerful position, but we're in a, an especially, um, you know, a position to make these decisions based upon the input from the experts in our School of Nursing and the experts in our medical center. They have a unique perspective on both public health, they have a unique perspective on care and treatment, and we've really been able to capture the full depth and breadth of their expertise, and they are leading many of the planning efforts that we will talk about today. This includes their expertise on both the diagnosis and the treatment, as well as prediction models that they are being, um, that they are really leading in terms of both in Nashville, in Middle Tennessee, and also on the national stage. I think we are incredibly lucky to have a school of nursing, a school of medicine, and the medical center on our campus and as our colleagues and really close partners in this incredibly challenging time. So in terms of thinking about this decision making, in terms of thinking about the evidence and the, the data behind our decisions, our return to campus plan has been people and mission focused. 
the flexible and the, the reasoned part of it was really to consider ramping up in phases. It may have seemed straightforward, although many of you know it was not necessarily straightforward to shut down and if you wanna say, um, send everyone home. Ramping up is much more complex and doing it in, fav in phases will allow us to stress test every aspect of our protocols will allow us to be sure that the plans that we have put in place are going to be as successful as possible. So the key has been in how we return to campus and how we return to in-person activities with the heart being focused on education and research missions. We'll also be taking, of course, actions to ensure that the health and well-being of everyone is protected as possible. Now this data-driven proactive approach is based upon the guidelines that are issued by national, state, local public health experts, for example, from the CDC or from the American College Health Association. For our athletics division, we also rely upon, rely upon task force that the, NASH, the NCAA and the SEC have formed. And then there are also reports that have been put out specifically in terms of universities that help guide our, and drive our decision-making. So as you know, on the next slide, we actually launched our return to campus phases back in the middle of May. Phase one began on May 1st, and that was a focused effort on restarting research activities that could not be easily conducted remotely. And then we divided all of our other mission-centric activities, be them experiential learning, campus instruction and professional or undergraduate degree programs, residential education, preparing the, the campus and the staff who will support them across all four different phases. Now I wanna emphasize again, and we've done this in different contexts that the Vanderbilt phases are distinct from the Nashville phases. So although we have to set our, um, if you wanna say minimal guidelines to their guidelines, we can also have guidelines which are more strict and protocols that are more in depth than the protocols of Nashville. But our phases are distinct from their phases, both in terms of protocols and also in terms of timing. So we started phase one on May 18th. And during that period of time, we welcomed back to campus to join those who were already on campus in phase zero, about 1,700 um, faculty, staff, and students. And during those weeks of phase one, I think we were very impressed with how um, everything went and in terms of how well the research operations um, ramped back up and how well people adhered to the protocols that we were putting in place. This allowed us to transition to phase two, which started on June 8th. So right now we're in phase two, and that means we're preparing for phase three. Phase three, wherein we'd be ramping up and be ready for on, more on-campus activity, in particular, welcoming back students for in-person instruction. So what are the protocols that we've put in place starting with phase one? The key protocols we've put in place are prevention protocols. How do we slow the spread, prevent the spread of COVID-19 on our campus? Key aspects of this that I wanna highlight are the first two you see on this slide. The wearing of face masks and coverings is required on our campus. That means required in all public spaces, whether indoors or outdoors. And I want to be sure that everyone understands how much I appreciate the fact that you adhere to this and that you set a great example to the rest of our community in terms of doing this and how we'll talk about towards the end of this um, presentation about how this shared responsibility will also have a component of, which, of it which makes everyone accountable for their actions on an individual level. In addition to wearing face masks, we must practice physical distancing. And physical distancing of at least six feet is what we are specifically looking at when we're considering our, physical, our, our spaces where people interact. We'll also be enabling everyone to practice good hand hygiene with hand sanitizers um, strategically deployed. We will also have strategies for conducting daily symptom monitoring, which Vice Chancellor Kopstein will talk about. And many of you know already that we have a lot of posted signage on campus 
and instructions, and we will be increasing that as we continue to ramp up. As well as, and I wanna thank everyone in our facilities team for helping and doing this hard work in terms of helping us maintain healthy environments through further cleaning and disinfection and air circulation within our buildings. So these protocols, one key aspect of them in terms of repairing the campus is on the next slide to help enable these protocols, it involves thinking about how we deploy our Vanderbilt resources in radically different ways, especially our physical space. A key aspect of our physical space is that we really need to de-densify the number of people to ensure that physical distancing. So a key element of that is our continuing to ask and have certain, certain groups of staff to continue working remotely where that's possible. We're also going through, and not we're, that's the royal we, okay? I know there's people in this town hall who are actually doing all this work, um, reimagining our classrooms and instruction spaces. And here you see a classroom that has been gone through and there are trash bags on some of the chairs. I told the students and families in that town hall, we won't have trash bags on chairs when we actually um, are welcoming that back for in-person instruction. But that, that's letting us lay out and determine the classroom capacity. We're also having to reimagine residential housing. We're having to adapt dining. And wherever we can, de-densifying through scheduling, through circulation planning, and through other methods and strategies. So on the next slide, as I mentioned, we've already ramped up our research activities using these protocols, using those strategies. And we are making decisions on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of how we continue to bring those research activities back to campus. And we continue continue to monitor that those prevention protocols are indeed mitigating or happening and slowing or preventing actually the COVID-19 spread. So as you know, research involves many different types of, of activities. You see some of them on this slide. And I'm really proud to say that we've been able to um, have many research staff um, come back and um, engage in their research activities, working with our faculty and students during this time. So with that, let's transition to uh, what were the major parts of our announcement last week. And that was how are we approaching the fall semester 2020? The key aspect of this approach is that it has to be flexible with built-in contingencies. It also has to provide an excellent education for all of our students. So in terms of thinking of those contingencies and flexibility, the plan is that we will hold in-person classes for the fall semester, but we will also coincidentally plan for online teaching. So all classes will have options for delivery by virtual or alternative platforms. Why is this important? Well, one, it provides for students who cannot get to campus due to travel restrictions or health risk accommodations so that they can continue to make progress towards their degree even though they cannot come to campus. It also provides for students who might wake up in the morning and not feel well, and that will encourage them to go straight to student health because they know that if they have to go to self-isolation or quarantine during the semester, they can continue taking their courses and continue in their progress toward their degree should they feel well enough. We also need to provide additional resources to advance the development of virtual and alternative platforms so that we have the very best educational experience offered to our students and also to provide for some faculty who are in high risk health groups and may need accommodations in terms of how their classes are presented. Finally, in terms of flexibility and also taking into account what's the data, what's the evidence, what are the facts that are known right now about COVID-19, was to think about our academic calendar. So what you're going to see on the next, uh, when I get to the academic calendar is that we've taken into account what the modeling is predicting in terms of a late coronavirus, a late fall, winter coronavirus season eliminating travel breaks during the semester so that we can mitigate the risks that are associated with travel, and then planning for a full 15-week um, academic calendar that allows for contingencies should a reduction be needed. So on the next um, slide, you'll see that these are just some of the components of a 
a fall semester plan. There have been working groups um, across these different areas as well as other different areas. And we're gonna walk through each of these different components in a little bit of detail and depth to give you an idea of what, what's going to be going on. So on the next slide, here's the academic calendar as laid out for the undergraduate and graduate schools. And so what you'll, you'll notice if you have looked up the academic calendar is that in some ways it's not all that different from what we'd originally planned. We've only moved the start date up two days to August 24th. However, you'll notice there's no fall break. It's continuous courses from the 24th of August through November 20th. But November 20th will be the last day of in-person classes. And at that point, we will ask everyone who can return home to return home for Thanksgiving break and to finish their classes online remotely for that last week that starts November 30th. And all will take their, their exams online. So this, we think, allows for um, us having students return home before that late coronavirus um, season hits and also eliminates travel breaks. Now that's detailed um, for the undergraduates and graduate schools. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, here are some of the, here are all the professional um, schools laid out. And multiple of them, Divinity, the Peabody programs, uh, the nursing school have many of their programs starting on August 24th, the same as the undergraduate program. The um, Owen has its mods start earlier and law has actually moved its start date up earlier. All of these programs, again, there will be um, no Labor Day and, or no fall break and they will all finish classes um, either before Thanksgiving or they, any classes after Thanksgiving will be online. So the next slide thinking um, at a high level about the pros and cons of these um, academic calendar plans. The pros are that we feel it allows flexibility, that the multimodal nature of both in-person as well as virtual and alternative allows that type of flexibility. We're inviting all students back together. We are not selecting between different colleges or schools or first year, second year, third year. We're inviting all students back together. Again, we've minimized travel-based risks, we feel, also anticipated the annual coronavirus season. And then by ending in-person classes on November 20th, giving families as much flexibility as possible in terms of how they choose to have their student return home following that last day of classes. In terms of the cons of this plan, we recognize that the lack of breaks is going to be challenging and that's going to be new and that it could um, create mental health and wellness challenges. But as you'll hear throughout this presentation, we are going to be deploying extra resources to try to proactively help support our community. I also want to fully acknowledge that the multimodal in terms of both in-person as well as virtual on alternative presentation modes for our curriculum requires additional effort for faculty and staff to prepare for both modes. But we feel that is really what is best for providing for the accommodations that are needed of both students and faculty. The most important thing that all of us will realize is that life and classes on campus will be different. And you'll see that as we continue to go throughout our presentation, but that the changes are necessary in order to diminish the risk. However, we also have to acknowledge that all risk cannot be mitigated. And that is true under any circumstances where you will bring people together. So in terms of triggers, uh, many people have asked, um, what would be an event that would um, require us to go back to online only, like we did back in the, the beginning of March? Well, first I want to say that we have learned a lot since the beginning of March um, from national um, research that's gone on, from international research that's gone on about how coronavirus prevention can be mitigated. And so in that way, I want to really convey that we will be monitoring the campus conditions in real time, the local conditions in real time, the national conditions in real time, so that we should have no surprises. However, if there's a local state or national shelter in place order, 
or restrictions that require us to go all remote, we will be required to do so. And most local, state, and national um, entities right now are specifically monitoring hospital caseload as a driver of that. We will be monitoring on our own campus our quarantine and self-isolation capacity for our residential population, and Vice Chancellor Kopstein will talk about that. We'll also be monitoring for surges in cases that are coupled to increased severity and illness amongst our different campus demographic cohorts. Much is being learned about that in the last month or two. And then further, our university community conditions may differ from Nashville conditions, and we'll want to be sensitive to that. As well as um, Vice Chancellor Kopstein will talk about our contact tracing analysis and whether or not we can determine whether or not a group of cases might be tied to a specific event or if they're tied to rapid community spread that is again tied to severe illness. So all of this is to say we're going to be thinking very carefully and communicating very consistently with our community about the status of campus. In terms of classroom and instructional spaces, I'll come back to this one more time. I said that life on campus would be different. Classes will be different. Um, this shows a different classroom that doesn't have trash bags, but it's got blue tape on the chairs. And I've also been assured that we'll be using other methods besides that blue tape when we, when we start classes back up. But we're implementing classroom protocols. Um, I'm grateful to VUIT for getting the classroom technology, video and streaming set up. I'm also grateful to so many of our staff across campus who helped us identify additional classroom spaces, be them conference rooms in your staff buildings, um, other spaces on campus that we can utilize to help add to our classroom inventory so we can offer as many in-person classes under physical distancing conditions as possible. We have a centralized registrar system, which is um, incredibly powerful in terms of our being able to optimize this room assignment in our registration processes. And then we're adopting best practices in terms of uh, how courses will be um, how courses will be developed. So on the next slide, I give you just a little bit of a, a peek into that. A lot of work has gone on by many different groups in terms of inventorying all those classrooms, both in terms of physical distancing as well as what ITAB equipment they have within them. Uh, right now, actively going on. About 90 different rooms are being outfitted with high-tech technology packages, as well as uh, leveraging existing video equipment in other classrooms. We're creating asynchronous recording studios that faculty and staff will be able to use, as well as establishing a loaner laptop program to ensure that our adaptive educational design will work and be successful. So all this data goes in um, into the registrar and goes directly to the faculty in the schools and colleges so that they can make decisions about their course designs. And then finally, um, our students will be able to see all that information as they're considering what courses they'll be taking for the fall. So with that, I wanna turn it over for um, a little section of the presentation to uh, right now, before I, we go back and forth between ourselves to Vice Chancellor Eric Kopstein. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Susan. I really appreciate the opportunity to provide some updates today. And I wanna thank all of the VU staff who joined us today. I also just wanna underscore the thanks um, and the praise for all of our staff. Um, you've all been very flexible. You've all been resilient. Many of you have contributed in extremely meaningful and important ways to these plans, and we really do want to acknowledge you and know that you are appreciated. So Susan covered a, a pretty wide range of topics already, you know, our approach to decision making, the campus wide protocols, um, this culture of shared responsibility. She talked about reimagining classrooms with physical distancing in mind and how courses can be delivered flexibly. Um, I'll begin by talking about our efforts to de-densify campus and how that relates to staff, as I know this is a topic that's on the minds of many of our participants today. So our approach to ramping up campus activity, as Susan said, is really centered around the Vanderbilt mission, and staff who are required to be on campus will be notified um, by their managers and leaders about expectations if and when uh, their staff members should return to campus. 
You heard about the physical distancing requirements established in the classroom environment and that we've identified hundreds of spaces across campus that we may need to use to augment our teaching space inventory this year. All of this does mean that staff who can conduct their work remotely will continue to do so until further notice. And this will help us keep the human population on campus less dense and lower and thereby help ensure safety and reduce the risk of COVID spread. Um, the HR team prepared a wealth of materials that assist managers with remote work, and they'll be rolling out webinars and more training for managers. Uh, Laura Nayron, who's one of the panelists today, she may have a chance to talk about that a little more during our Q&A. Um, a key point is at the bottom of this slide, and I want you to again know that safety is our first concern, but we also acknowledge that the pandemic has proven something I've always believed, that a substantial amount of our work can be conducted effectively without being on campus. And we are thinking really carefully about the longer term implications of a distributed work model. So there'll be more to come on that. Next slide, please. We've also carefully studied our outdoor environments and how it is that members of our community move from one part of campus to another throughout the day. So circulation plans are being implemented right now throughout the entire, uh, the entire campus as part of our prep efforts. Our goals are really several fold. We want to ensure movement across the campus is well organized, that pathways are clearly marked with signage and movement patterns are highly legible. We want to ensure that the movement of pedestrians and bicycles and how those modalities really work together is clear and understandable. And we think that a well-defined circulation plan for campus can help enable the safety of our community. Um, this planning around exterior spaces and navigation is really guided by several core principles that are noted here. We really wanna start simple and use time as an asset so that we can study movement patterns across campus and we're prepared to make any necessary adjustments. We think we have a good plan for the campus navigation, but this is an example of how our plans are built to be flexible and they can allow us to change and make improvements based on really what we observe and data that we gather. Um, our campus circulation plans also acknowledge that people need room to move around and to maneuver. And we identify, as you can see on this map, what we call a gold path that enables two-way circulation on campus paths that are wide enough to allow for um, bi-directional movement and some of the other pathways will be established as one-way routes. We acknowledge that people do actually require time to react to movement around them as they go from one place to another with physical distancing, and our plans take that into account. Um, we've underscored the centrality to our fall plans of supporting our mission, and even identifying and following outdoor circulation patterns, that will really increase our ability to, to deliver, you know, our campus residential living and learning model during this very uh, unique period of time. Okay, so this kind of thinking <clears throat> extends beyond circulation and even more broadly into Vanderbilt's uh, outdoor spaces. Our goal is for as many as possible of our really wonderful outdoor landscapes and green spaces to remain open and to be accessible so that we can maximize options for movement, for individual choice, and to enable physical distancing. We also know that outdoor spaces have a range of uses. Um, they might be used to relax or to study, to eat. And our plans are really structured to ensure appropriate outdoor activities can continue, but safely and responsibly. Um, as we've said, we'll have highly visible signage installed throughout the campus. That'll assist with wayfinding. It'll highlight our campus protocols um, as well as personal responsibility. We, uh, our outdoor furniture uh, volume and placement will also be based on physical distancing. And it's something as well that we can adjust as necessary over time. Um, I like to say that the outdoor spaces of Vanderbilt's campus are really this wonderful canvas that connects all of our buildings. And we want our community members to access and utilize these spaces um, in responsible ways. Next slide, please. 
And then likewise, we have what we call a circulation team that's been working very hard. This is overseen by our chief facility officer, Mike Perez, and they've mapped out circulation plans for every building on campus that identify really the points of ingress and egress, where exactly we're gonna place signage, all the locations for hand sanitizing stations, the use of elevators and restrooms. Um, and I wanna note here, these circulation plans do take accessibility into account to ensure that we have accessible entrances and exits um, in all of our buildings that are clearly marked. So basically typical day-to-day -day activities of just getting around a, a building are being basically fully reimagined with physical distancing in mind. And as a result, we have to reimagine, you know, how we use our buildings during the pandemic. Um, these changes are gonna require that people coming to campus are aware of the changes and they'll have to adjust their own patterns a little bit um, as necessary. Um, on our website for Return to Campus, you can find circulation plans for each building uh, posted there and you can look at those uh, maps. So dining services is really a critical element of our on-campus experience for our undergrads. And this area has received, I think, just a tremendous amount of of attention. Um, it's really been under the leadership of David Turkile, our director of dining, in partnership with a range of other people across campus. So Rand Dining Hall, which you see pictured um, on this slide to the left, that remained open throughout the spring and the summer until, until very recently when we switched our primary summer location for food prep over to the Hendricks room. Um, dining was an early adopter of our campus protocols and really in that way has been in a leading position really to inform our plans for other parts of the campus. And I have to say, I think they've done just a tremendous job. Um, healthy, nutritious meal options, that is always a top priority at Vanderbilt and that today and in the future absolutely remains the case. Um, I'm excited that the Nicholas S. Zeppos College Dining Hall will open in the fall and that gives us another option uh, for a dining location in the West End neighborhood of our campus. Um, you can see we've also expanded our mobile ordering options for students uh, that now include Munchie Marts and Susie's Cafes. And we've also identified um, campus dining, what we call pickup spots that will correlate with where there are high densities of students during the day in an effort to really enable physical distancing. Students um, will still be able to use their meal money and Commodore cash for the nearby Taste of Nashville options. And I think it's gonna be fun. We're gonna augment our lineup this year and as a result, help de-densify by bringing um, a rotation of food trucks to campus on a daily basis. So now I think, Susan, I turn it back to you. That's right. And so um, on the next slide, uh, I want to just talk you through our multimodal plan for our residential housing. So just like a multimodal plan for curriculum delivery, we also tried to think of a, it's not one size fits all in terms of our residential housing. And I, I want to thank Dean of Students Mark Bandos and the Dean of Students Areas and Jim Krampka and all of housing in terms of really thinking deeply about how our residential housing will reopen. So we've taken guidance from multiple different reports, which involves in terms of our deploying single rooms as a priority, as well as family unit models as a priority. Family unit model being where suite mates and roommates are considered a family unit and exempt within that room from social distancing. And then we also are taking into consideration um, bathroom facilities or student to facility ratio and how to best set those up for ensuring um, that they are as safe as possible. Overall, all the priorities that have been used by the team have focused on utilizing our resources as much as possible. And again, as I said, not a one size fits all. So three different cohorts with different needs. Our, our first year students will all be in single rooms. And to do that, we actually have to put them in two different locations. Uh, one half will be on the commons and the other half will be in Branscombe Quad as well as the Carmichael Tower, which is still standing thankfully so that we have extra beds and extra room for these students. Because the commons experience is integral 
and their first year experience is integral. We also want each student in this class of 2024 to be able to live on the commons for one semester. So the students will actually switch and flip at that semester break. All students will be assigned to a house at the beginning of the year, and they will also have who would have been their roommate, you know, um, now as a virtual roommate, although they won't get to meet them in person, they won't be entirely virtual, but they will also be able to connect with each other, um, even when they're in their different rooms on different sides of campus. For our upper division students, we've given all of those students the option to live off campus if they would like. And we also will have um, single options and the family unit model option for them, because of course they have friends, they know each other, and um, many of them uh, wish to actually choose to be in such a family unit model. And we're looking at other um, increased capacity options so that we can accommodate everyone who needs to be accommodated. And then finally, our varsity student athletes. Uh, because of special protocols that will be needed for them to practice and travel and for competitions, we're co-housing them all together in one location. And um, they will actually co-house with teammates, although those first year varsity student athletes will again have a common house affiliation so that they can be connected with our first year orientation programming. So as we think about that um, housing experience, I know many of you have asked questions about move-in because uh, I love going to move in. It's the most exciting on, on the commons. And, and unfortunately, we won't have a single move-in day. Again, think about that de-densify strategy. So in order to promote a safe move-in, it'll be staged over multiple days the week before classes begin on, on August 24th. And what we've told our students and families is that those specific move-in schedules and details won't be available until early July because we all know we, we are still have a lot of work to get all those logistics and coordinations nailed down. So that's um, one part of uh, if you want to say campus life. The other part of campus life, which I know our Dean of Students um, and our student organization areas are thinking very deeply about is how we still offer students a, a meaningful out of classroom experience under, uh, using, under the conditions needed for prevention of COVID-19 spread. So we're actually directly engaging students in terms of helping design this programming. Um, we are having them consider how they can do this under uh, campus-wide limitations on the sizes of gatherings that will be in place. We're having them think of ways to modify how they do their service and, and where actually they will be having and holding activities that, they're, they are take, that they are hosting. And all compliance in terms of the protocols that will be adapted for um, student organizations will be overseen through our Office of Student Accountability as it is right now. So I'm going to turn it back to Vice Chancellor Kopstein to talk about all the protocols that are being implemented to actually help complement our prevention protocols for health and well being. Well, thanks, Susan. Um, I'm going to talk here a little bit about testing, tracing, and uh, separating. So there are a number of people at Vanderbilt who right now are, are working tirelessly um, so that we can implement what I would call a best in class COVID-19 safety and surveillance approach. Um, our plans and our principles are really outlined in broad strokes on this slide. We are gonna utilize the, uh, a lot of expertise and are utilizing a lot of expertise to inform our plans. And again, we're fortunate to have expert resources that we're bringing to bear, including the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, our School of Nursing, and our Public Health Task Force. They've been very helpful. We'll be able to adjust our plans dependent on emergent situations and also in coordination with updated public health guidance. We think that testing, tracing, and surge capabilities are really critical functions that we simply have to have available to uh, really ramp up responsibly. We're also going to provide a holistic support model for the health and well beings of our students and our community. And we'll support the navigation of health needs uh, within our community. And by doing so, we're also supporting the broader public health aspirations of Nashville as a city. Next slide, please. So many of you um, 
on this Zoom today probably know that about five years ago, we launched Vandy Safe. This is a smartphone based app. It has a number of functions that are focused on safety for our students, our faculty and our staff. Um, for example, you can schedule a GPS tracked uh, virtual walk home that can be monitored centrally by our dispatch center or even by like a friend, a parent, a colleague. You can contact through Vandy Safe, our public safety dispatch center as well directly. And you can even chat if you want in real time with Vanderbilt Public Safety. And you can use the tool to send in observations about occurrences and conditions on campus. So we've um, already added a COVID-19 section to the app. Um, as it currently stands, it includes um, lots of details on our return to campus plan and protocols. It has information on who to contact and what to do if you're not feeling well. It has information on a bunch of other campus services. And it also includes a Vanderbilt specific symptom monitoring tool. So daily symptom monitoring is uh, noted as a requirement of our return to campus plan. And the app provides our community with really a simple tool to conduct the daily symptom monitoring. So the symptom monitoring text in the app is based on CDC guidance, but it is made Vanderbilt specific. And when a per person um, completes the questionnaire, as you can see here on the slide, um, when they complete it in the symptom monitoring app, they get basically a red light, green light that indicates their current health status. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to go into a little more depth about Vanderbilt's plans for COVID-19 testing. This part of our plan, I think it's one of the most important aspects of our planning, particularly given the fact that the testing capability landscape is really changing rapidly. So our objective here is to implement a plan that's gonna inspire confidence across our community, um, including with the parents of our students, but also with the broader Nashville community. So as we developed um, a testing strategy, we knew that something like, you know, a rapid turnaround daily testing of all members of our community is something that's just not plausible currently at Vanderbilt or anywhere else. And it's also, frankly, not in alignment with public health guidance. So what we did was we took a risk-based approach that's really informed by public guidance and a lot of input, again, from our School of Nursing and the Vanderbilt Medical Center. We broke uh, the Vanderbilt community into what we call a number of risk-based groups or categories. And this graphic here identifies four broad categories of BU and identifies distinct strategies for these communities and looks at them in terms of the number of people um, for whom a given strategy applies and also the intensity of the testing protocol applicable to each of those strategies and groups. So you can see, for example, the baseline strategy applies to all members of our community. Then as we move to the upper left quadrant, um, you see strategy one, which applies to high exposure faculty and staff um, for whom a greater than baseline set of protocols will be applied. Um, strategy two is for all members of the undergrad population and strategy three really applies to student athletes. And yes, we know they are a subset of the undergraduate population, but they will uh, require a specific set of testing protocols. And again, these strategies and their implementation are really made possible again through our partnership with the School of Nursing and our medical center. Next slide, please. Um, so faculty and staff, um, we wanna talk about them in regards to testing and support. So faculty and staff with COVID-19 symptoms need to contact occupational health by phone. And when they do that, they'll get guidance on screening and testing. And faculty and staff as noted here can also contact uh, their own medical provider uh, to gain information, including where there are testing locations um, in their specific areas. So faculty and staff who are deemed you know, to be at higher risk on campus for potential exposure to COVID, um, they may be tested before our students arrive. And our post arrival, what we call surveillance testing plan includes additional testing for faculty and staff on campus. Um, I can say that more detailed information on testing will be available through our return to campus website um, as all of the 
uh, minute details are really worked out and documented. So Vanderbilt, um, as you may have heard, will be testing undergraduate students upon arrival to campus. And as our planning really started to formulate, we realized pretty early that a physical location to conduct high volume testing um, would be really necessary to accomplish our goals. And again, testing at scale and having ongoing scalable capabilities post arrival of undergrads, we think is just a must, a must have. Um, to accomplish really our on-campus residential living and learning mission. And you can see here, we've identified a section of the David Williams II Student Rec and Wellness Center for large-scale testing. I know many of you are familiar with this facility um, and you know the rec center in this regard has several advantages. It's, it's large, it's secure, it has really good uh, technology connectivity, and it's also controlled by VU card access. Um, as you can see here on the plan, what we've done is mapped out circulation and physical layouts to enable and really support large scale testing. We can also use the rec center to house the staff and some of the capabilities that will support our testing and tracing incident command center. So this plan is currently laid out can enable about 18 testing stations that can handle up to 1500 tests per day. I know that many of you on the call participate in our annual Flula Palooza event. And you know, that's when on a single day on campus, literally thousands of Vanderbilt University and Medical Center community members receive flu shots. And it's just that type of really tightly orchestrated, you know, kind of high throughput approach that's inspired for what, uh, what we intend to achieve here around COVID testing. And it's also worth noting that this physical plan is enabled uh, to, enable the uh, ongoing use of much of the rec center for its normal you know, purposes of working out and for other you know, health and wellness activities. So the ability to conduct rapid and meaningful contact tracing is another really core aspect of an overall disease surveillance plan as our plans to identify quarantine space for individuals who are awaiting test results. So the number of individuals who might be identified as contacts to a COVID positive case um, can really become quite large. And in a campus environment, really rapid contact tracing follow-up is gonna be very important if we're gonna reduce spread, particularly with our undergrad population. Um, if a Vanderbilt faculty, staff, or postdoc is positive, occupational health will notify public health officials, and they'll follow up with the individual to conduct contact tracing, as well as daily health screenings. And once again, our partners at the School of Nursing are stepping up to help. Um, Vanderbilt is implementing a model, again, with the assistance of the School of Nursing, where under the supervision of some of our experienced school and nursing faculty, we'll have nursing students who can form a pool of contact tracers if we need surge capacity for contact tracing beyond what we can already do through our occupational health and student health centers. And this approach, um, this model really has several fold advantages. It's scalable. Again, it relies on the expertise of our school of nursing and our medical center. And it really allows Vanderbilt to carry out contact tracing in a controlled, rigorous way. Um, I'll also say we're exploring technology-based approaches that could bolster further the efficiency of our contact tracing program. But I'll say technology, we think, um, can play an effective part in the contact tracing process, but it's not a substitute for the human element of following up. So we'll have a plan in place that doesn't rely solely on technology, but can really be enhanced and improved by it. And then um, also on here, consistent with guidance from the CDC, we note the importance of quarantining while test results are processed. So the right-hand section of this slide outlines the plan and the locations for members of the VU community and where they're expected to quarantine while awaiting um, their test results. You can see um, faculty and staff are expected to quarantine at their uh, place of residence while they await COVID-19 test results. So Vanderbilt 
also has a detailed plan for the quarantine and isolation of students who've been exposed to or tested positive for COVID-19. So students who have been exposed to COVID-19 and are awaiting test results need to quarantine and students who are positive, including asymptomatic positives, need to be isolated. Um, our current plan includes a space allowance that can house about 6% of the VU on-campus undergraduate population. The Skerritt Bennett Center um, is located, you can see on the east side of campus and it's highlighted by the black circle here to the left of the map on this slide. And Blakemore House, which is uh, identified by the circle to the right on the map is located more on the westerly side of campus. Um, in combination, these two facilities can provide about 285 beds for quarantine and isolation. Um, these spaces have advantages in that they're easy to access while remaining relatively secluded from the denser parts of central campus. And as we, in the coming days, finalize details concerning exactly how many students will live off campus, our quarantine and isolation housing plans will become further refined and we'll have more information on that um, on our website shortly. So again, we realize that the rapid changes that occurred really at the front end of the pandemic and the ongoing changes in all of our work and personal lives are, are really profound. And here, um, I wanna take a moment to identify resources that are available now to provide our community with a pretty broad range of health and well being resources. So, Vanderbilt partners with the Vanderbilt Medical Center Occupational Health Group for services, which I mentioned several times in some of the earlier slides. And we also partner with Occupational Health on the Employee Assistance Program and also on Health Plus. We have family based resources that include child care, family, and elder care, and those are provided by the Vanderbilt Child and Family Center. Um, I'll say that Vanderbilt University HR recently welcomed a wonderful member of our community, Stacy Bonner, who is formerly at the Vanderbilt Child and Family uh, Centers as its new HR well being manager. And we look forward to sharing uh, with her help additional resources that support what we call the the whole person aspect of VU um, employees, which include well-being, diversity, and community. And if you have questions about any of the resources that are available, you can reach out um, to HR and to Stacy um, for more info. So again, here I'll emphasize that it's the safety and well-being of the entire Vanderbilt community that's just absolutely foundational to our plans. And we realize that some members of the Vanderbilt community really are at higher risk of serious implications should they contract COVID-19. And we've put in place um, an expedited process for the intake and for the analysis of accommodation requests for faculty and staff. And the streamlined approach is really intended to provide quick <clears throat> and meaningful uh, follow-up. So Vanderbilt follows ADA and all other relevant employment law when we review accommodation requests. And so I want to ensure that you know that medical information about any individuals is not included in their personal files. It's kept completely separate and confidential through our um, EEO office. Next slide, please. Oh, you may have heard last week um, that Interim Chancellor and Provost Susan Wente, uh, she launched a new working group to focus on Vanderbilt's uh, childcare needs across our community in response to what we know are the closing of a lot of schools and facilities as a result of the pandemic. Um, Kathleen Siebel, who's the Executive Director of the Vanderbilt Child and Family Center, along with Ben Harris, um, who's a senior lecturer in music and also the incoming Faculty Senate Vice Chair, they will lead the working group. And I know that right now they're identifying and will shortly convene a number of faculty and staff who will be basically charged with advising on the development of best practices and contingency plans. While meanwhile, local school and childcare leaders are formulating their own plans for the upcoming school year. Um, the group's purpose is really to advise university leadership and to make um, recommendations that enable 
what we think of as the best support of childcare needs for faculty, our staff, our postdocs, and our graduate and professional uh, students during these really you know, quite uncertain times. And I'd also like to, um, in closing on this slide, underscore that there is a mechanism in place now for members of the community to share feedback and concerns on childcare. And we really look forward, I think, to making some quick progress on this topic with the working group's help. And we'll communicate broadly um, as we're always committed to across the community about findings and next steps. So that I think brings to conclusion um, my part of the presentation here and I'll hand it now back over to Susan. So I just want to wrap up with a, a few comments on shared responsibility, as I had noted at the beginning. And so um, coming back to campus, uh, protecting one another is incredibly important. And so for those of you who've already come back to campus and have been on campus, you know that we are requiring faculty, staff, postdocs, and we will require every one of our students to sign our COVID-19 return to campus acknowledgement form. This includes a learning module, which goes through the protocols. Um, it also explains the risk and responsibilities that are associated with return to campus. We will be very attentive to ensuring adherence to these protocols. Intentional or reckless disregard of these policies and protocols will be addressed through um, our different progressive disciplinary processes. Um, for staff members, that will be handled through HR. For our students, that's through the Office of Student Accountability. And for our faculty, that's through the faculty manual and their deans. So we, we have a different path for each cohort, but there are pathways that we know work in terms of ensuring adherence to protocols. In terms of shared responsibility, it's not just that compliance aspect, but it's also this aspect of the fact that we are a community that is compassionate and cares for one another and wants to help one another do the right thing. So in terms of thinking about how we help one another do the right thing, we actually launched a, at that transition to phase zero to phase one, I really wanna thank our um, public safety department and our community service officers for helping us roll this out and get launched the public health ambassadors. And so this, these will be individuals across campus, faculty, staff, and again, students who will volunteer to help everyone, help everyone take care of each other whether that's passing out masks, whether that is reminders in a proactive communication approach way, these people are gonna be really important to our shared responsibility program. And finally, on the next slide, communications. So we have to be sure that everyone is aware. And as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of details here. There's a lot of information here, but we're gonna be reinforcing it, communicating in multiple different forms in multiple different ways. And so the newest campaign, which I wanna thank our communications division for spearheading and rolling out, I'm gonna let it speak for itself in this video that follows. So together, I am incredibly confident that we will anchor down and step up and we will be a community that cares for one another and continues working together as one Vanderbilt. So with that, we're gonna to transition to our question and answer session.
Great. Thank you so much. You have covered a lot of very helpful information today, hitting on some of the incredible thought and detail that have gone into this return to campus plan. And you've already hit on some of the inquiries that we received ahead of today's town hall. Uh, for everyone participating today, we won't be able to get to every question that was asked, but we are capturing everything that's been submitted and the university is working to address as many of your questions as possible. And I'm going to reshare the link here in the chat in case you have additional questions. Over the next few days, we will be adding more information to our Return to Campus website and updating the FAQs. Again, you can visit that Return to Campus website at vu.edu slash fall 2020. And now we are also joined by Interim Associate Vice Chancellor for Human Capital and Business Services, Laura Nayron, and she's gonna provide some additional information and responses as we head into the Q&A. So on to the questions. Um, we had a lot of questions about remote work. For staff who have been working remotely, are there campus-wide plans to bring them back to in-person work? Um, Vice Chancellor Kopstein and Interim Associate Vice Chancellor Neron, is this something that you can speak to? You want to start off, Laura? Why don't you go? Ahead? Absolutely. Um, so there have been so many references to the Return to Campus website, and I really encourage staff to, to go visit that site. I, I think I check it almost daily. There's a very handy search box on there. Um, but if you go to that site, you'll see um, uh, references to the approach for return to campus for staff um, included in the um, three things you need to know at the very top and in all four phases of the return to campus plan. There are statements along the lines of staff being recalled to campus in an orderly fashion in support of core mission activities. So those for, uh, that are directly related to on-campus research, on-campus instruction, and undergraduate uh, residential living and learning activities. Uh, staff will be informed by their supervisors when and under, what, and, and under what circumstances they are to return to work on campus and should not return until they're authorized. So this really speaks to, this language speaks to the diversity of the work that we do on campus and how critically important it is to consider the type of work um, its relation to mission, and whether that type of work can effectively be uh, performed remotely or whether this really needs to take place on campus. So it's so important, I think, for uh, leaders who are in the best position to make these evaluations, to hold those principles in, in mind as they make those decisions and communicate those. I'll also say that Vice Chancellor uh, Kopstein made reference to um, some guidance that HR has published on our homepage at hr.vanderbilt.edu. It's at the top under the COVID-19 banner. And it's called the HR Guide to Supporting Leaders and Staff During COVID-19. As we think about a more prolonged remote work period, we recognize that this is a very different operating mode than we're used to, and we need more tools and resources to navigate this successfully. So that guide is out there, it's pretty beefy. Um, and so we will be holding webinars and sessions to unpack that, to talk about the real world applications of it and to support a more prolonged remote work period through tools and resources. Yeah, that's a great and very uh, comprehensive answer, Laura. And I'll just hark back to a few of the comments I made earlier about really it's important for us to keep the campus as de-densified as possible. So again, a lot of careful planning and communication underway to make the uh, remote work period as you know flexible, but also as productive as possible. And again, I know Laura and her team are working on rolling out a number of new webinars and a number of new moments of contact. And I'll also just say that Laura and I have continued um, along with Andre Churchwell actually to meet frequently with the University Staff Advisory Committee. And that will be another channel through which Laura and I and others will communicate um, about things such as what we're talking about now. That's great, that's very helpful. So as a reminder, in addition to the Return to Campus website, the HR website also has a lot of other resources. Great. Uh, another question that came in quite a lot is one that a lot of staff are thinking about, particularly if they are gonna be returning to campus. Uh, how will the university enforce campus protocols such as masks and facial coverings or physical distancing, particularly for students? And this is a question that I think all three of you can address. So Interim Chancellor Wente, we can start with you. Well, as I referred to, compliance is going to serve a really important piece in our return to campus plan. And compliance is going to be absolutely critical to preventing the spread of the virus. So for our whole campus, faculty, staff, students, visitors that we're committed to, um, educating that we're committed to working with together, everyone 
if everyone has an individual responsibility. So a lot of this will come from our community looking out for one another. As I said, we need to presume that, that people just need help in being reminded. And we're also gonna use our Anchor Down Step Up campaign to create a campus culture of following those protocols. And then finally, we will have um, our campus-wide standards of conduct in terms of their implementation and from the student handbook or the faculty manual or the HR um, guide that we'll be able to rely upon in terms of ultimate compliance. Yeah, I'll just add, <clears throat> I mean, that, that, that's all correct. Um, compliance is obviously really important and there is this quote unquote enforcement aspect of it. I remain really hopeful that our community can really develop this culture of what we like to call shared responsibility and that people as our video described can really step up and be part of the solution by becoming, for instance, public health, health ambassadors and just doing the right things. Um, you know, following the protocols is not just about helping ensure your own safety. It's about ensuring the safety of the entirety of the community. And so I'm really hopeful, again, that we can lead with um, ways to really incentivize and encourage people to act really responsibly and that enforcement will have to be relied upon less. However, uh, as we've described, there will need to be mechanisms in place to ensure that if people are not conforming uh, with these standards that we can take appropriate actions. Laura, do you wanna to add to that at all? Sure, I think you, know, you and Interim Chancellor Provost Wente covered a lot of it. The one thing I will say as a staff member that we, you know, we come together in community, it's what makes Vanderbilt a special place to work. And during this time where everything feels out of our control, so many things feel out of our control, we do know that proper, uh, proper hand hygiene, wearing a mask and pro uh, practicing social distancing is within our control and can prevent the spread of this virus. So um, I think it comes from a place of caring about keeping ourselves healthy and our colleagues healthy that we um, come together in support of these protocols. We all have a role to play as we anchor down and step up right now. Right. Uh, exactly. we have a number of staff members, such as those in admissions, athletics, and development and alumni relations who spend a lot of time on the road. And we had questions about whether there were any updates on travel restrictions for Vanderbilt employees. And Interim Associate Vice Chancellor Nayron, would you be able to address this question? Sure, so I actually consulted the Return to Campus website because this is an evolving circumstance and it's always great to have live information. Um, at this point, the um, the the statement still stands that university sponsored domestic and international travel is restricted um, and that uh, that if uh, approved by a vice chancellor or a dean that, that that could be evaluated but at this point that that still stands. Great, thank you. Uh, Interim Chancellor Wente, you talked earlier about move-in, and uh, in the past we've had a lot of employees who have pitched in on some very warm but very fun August days to help with move-in, uh, particularly in past years. What will that effort look like this year? Well, as I mentioned earlier, move-in will look different this year. It has to look different just because of those prevention protocols. So one, it will take place over multiple days. The schedules have not yet been announced. Um, I, I, I just really love how the staff turn out, but, and I know it's disappointing to many of the staff that um, you won't be able to take place in this really beloved tradition, but we will be also um, limiting the number of family members that can um, help the student move in. We're trying to do everything that we can to keep our campus and to keep our, our students um, safe during this time. So we won't have a move-in crew. Um, but we are thinking carefully about um, how we'll be welcoming our students during that time. But I want, to, I want you to all look forward to the fall of 2021 and, and uh, I'll appreciate welcoming you back to that move in. I know we all, I think we all remember seeing photos and video of you at move in last year and it is such a wonderful beloved tradition as you said. So we, uh, we will look forward to that in years to come. Uh, earlier in the presentation, you talked about triggers for reverting back to remote learning. Can you talk a little bit more about the university's contingency plan if our city or the larger region sees a second wave of the coronavirus in the fall or cases, and if we have to reinitiate the safer at home order here in Nashville, what would that look like for our campus? 
Well, the most important contingency plan we're putting in place is the fact that we'll be in position to teach both remotely as well as in person um, very, very quickly on a turn of a dime, if you might say. But also, um, we are in a position where we can monitor in real time the public health situation of not only our campus, but also the Nashville community. So again, as I tried to convey, we don't want any surprises. We want to, we'll be you know, monitoring through all of those um, efforts that Eric Kopstein talked about in terms of um, through occupational health and through student health, um, what the status of our community is. So I, I talked about on that one slide, which will be posted, what some of those general criteria are, but I just want everyone to be assured that um, we will be able to comply with the Safer at Home order. We'll also be able to comply with our own guidelines um, should they be, um, it, it, as I expect, as we did, we shut down before the city shut down back in March because we're always looking at what we need to do to best protect our community. Yeah, and the, the, the only thing I might add to um, Susan's comments are that um, Susan made the good point earlier that the phased ramp up of Vanderbilt and its phases and the activities are distinct from, but still somehow informed by and related to Nashville's own plan uh, for reopening in a phased way. And what's important um, and a point of commonality across the Nashville and the Vanderbilt plans are that there is the possibility that as phases move forward from one to two to three to four, that they could also move backwards depending on you know, public health conditions. And so this notion, as Susan described, of being able to conduct all of our uh, teaching online as necessary is great. And we've proven already and have gone through um, the exercise of being able to rather rapidly and as necessary ramp down campus activities. Now we're hoping that won't be the case, but I feel like um, especially given the learnings from the uh, spring, we're well positioned should that need to happen. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chancellor Kopstein, we got a live question that I think you might be able to best address. Some Vanderbilt staff work in office spaces that are leased by the university. Will those office spaces and leased buildings be cleaned to the same standards as university owned buildings? Yeah, the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, so our Vanderbilt University plan operations in partnership with Vanderbilt University real estate has been working closely. Um, with every one of our building management firms, and it is absolutely our, in our intent and our expectation, which we will monitor, that the same university cleaning protocols are applied uniformly across any spaces uh, that Vanderbilt leases. Great, thank you. Interim Associate Vice Chancellor Nayron, I think this is a question that you might be able to best address. Uh, several questions came in regarding hourly workers and changes in their work hours as we shifted to remote work and remote learning in the spring and additional possible changes as we've started to ramp up again for the fall semester. What would your advice be and how uh, hourly workers can discuss these changes with their managers? That's a great question. And I do think it really, again, speaks to the dynamic and varied type of work that we do. I think those conversations are really important to have as we think about the long term um, and uh, kind of level set in terms of expectations. I certainly think that if they, if it, any employee at any time is welcome to contact their HR consultant for some guidance on how to maybe uh, begin that conversation. Hopefully they feel comfortable starting that conversation of let's talk about the fall and expectations around that. Um, but please know that HR is always a resource um, to staff who may have, it might be helpful just to, to talk through an approach. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have had a couple of questions about how buildings are being prepared for ramp up, both related to circulation and ensuring that systems are prepared. Vice Chancellor Kopstein, can you touch a little bit on the building readiness process as we head back into the fall semester? Yes, absolutely. I will um, here again uh, underscore the excellent work of the facilities department comprehensively. And um, while I don't have it on me and cannot recite every one of the details, there is a uh, building form for every building that has a large number of items that need to be checked, which include you know, HVAC systems, plumbing, heating, um, you know, the physical conditions, making sure 
that circulation plans are laid out. So all of this is being conducted in a very, very detailed manner. Um, and every single building is basically getting a full inspection and a uh, checkup before it is brought back, you know, let's say as people return to campus. And we're going to be very thorough in being in those buildings, uh, you know, not only during this period of time, but particularly as we move forward, um, should there be any further needs for adjustments to systems or anything else. Great. Thank you. Uh, we want to be mindful of everyone's time, so we just have time for one more question. Um, this question involves visitors to our campus. Uh, we have a beautiful campus that's a very popular place for people from around Nashville to come and, and walk and, and enjoy uh, the, really so many parts of our campus. What are the protocols for visitors to our campus? This is an interesting topic, and it's one that is truly right now the source of a lot of internal discussion. Um, we cannot and do not intend to try to wall off the campus so that people in the community cannot come here, but we do expect that members of our community, you know, abide the same protocols on our campus because we think that they're important um, across the entirety of our campus as a place. One of the ways in which we have been encouraging um, our community members who might be visiting, and I've witnessed this as recently as today, is through our public health ambassadors um, who have a range of information about the health protocols. They have uh, things like masks available and in a very friendly approachable way, for instance, if they see someone visiting campus who's not abiding our protocols, they will approach them again in a friendly way, ask them, are they familiar with our protocols? If no, here's what they are. Oh, you don't have a mask on, perhaps you need one. Here's one for you. So that's one mechanism. Another mechanism is ongoing dialogue uh, with community groups, particularly neighborhood associations for those parts um, for the, that surround the campus and working with the chambers to let people know that, you know, we take this really, really seriously and um, forget what the rest of the city may or may not be doing. We want Vanderbilt as a place and all the people who are coming to campus um, to understand and to really abide by our protocols. So it's not just members of our own campus community that have to anchor down and step up. It's really anyone that comes to the Vanderbilt campus is gonna be asked to, to do that. Well, great. Well, thank you everyone for all of the questions today. For those that we weren't able to get to, as we said earlier, the university will continue to address responses on the Return to Campus website, particularly in the FAQ section. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back to Interim Chancellor and Provost Wente. Well, I hope that this information has provided clarity and that it's provided comfort to you as we continue to work together, as we continue to look forward. We see these components that we've laid out as a really strong blueprint for our future, but we know we're gonna continue building on it. We're gonna continue refining it. We're gonna continue learning. We're gonna continue discovering. We're gonna continue looking for the very best data, the very best evidence, the very best practices to bring to our campus to help ensure the health and safety of everyone and to help ensure that we are acting on our missions of research and teaching. We are all gonna to work together to share accountability. We're all gonna be flexible and compassionate and transparent with one another. That is my vow to you. I encourage each of you to spend time on the Return to Campus website. It has extensive information for staff as well as faculty, students, visitors and other campus groups. So finally, thank you for joining us today. And I'll look forward to seeing you either in another Zoom town hall and potentially on campus very soon. Thank you.